Hello and welcome to part four in our resource series on self-hypnosis. I'm Richard Nonyard with SubliminalScience.com and this week I'm going to talk about hypnosis and mindfulness or what's sometimes referred to as mindfulness meditation. Often people see self-hypnosis as being so vastly different from meditation that the two are not related at all. I see in my experience the words really describe in many ways the same phenomena. A recent book this past year by Michael Yapko, a clinical psychologist, probably most well known for his book called Trance Work, uh, really draws the same conclusion in his book that I've drawn in my practice. In my office, I teach almost every client who I work with a basic strategy for mindfulness. What I'm really teaching them is self-hypnosis. And so in this series, since I'm focusing on self-hypnosis, I'm going to be teaching you some ideas about mindfulness. Just this past week, I had a client who came in who was worried that he was mentally ill, and he was worried that his thoughts might be crazy thoughts. And so I taught him mindfulness as a way to not follow those thoughts, but simply to observe the thoughts. Had I told him my goal would be to eliminate those thoughts, that would have been overwhelming because we really can't stop our thoughts, especially thoughts that we're trying to stop. But an approach where I taught this client mindfulness made all the difference in the world to his really ability to cope on a day-to-day -day basis. Just this past week, I saw an older woman who had had a heart attack a year ago. She had quit smoking a month ago, but she complained that she was still obsessed with cigarettes and knew if she didn't stay quit that she would die. She was also filled with grief over the death of a family member who... Uh, passed away eight years ago and had seen many different counselors but found no relief in teaching her the concept of mindfulness. She was able to experience some relief that she hadn't been able to experience to that point. Recently, I worked with an Afghan war veteran. He was diagnosed with PTSD. He was in the middle of a divorce. His depression and anxiety were going through the roof. I taught him mindfulness. Another client was a weight loss client who already knew everything she needed to do to lose weight, but never found the motivation to follow through on that goal. Each one of these clients uh, did well. Uh, one found immediate release in uh, suffering in that very first session because I taught them mindfulness. Mindfulness is a core therapeutic approach, yet it's based on centuries of knowledge. Mindfulness is actually the cornerstone of healthy living emotional intelligence, and what the Buddhists referred to as right thinking. So what exactly is mindfulness? Well, it's a strategy. It's the art and practice of paying attention to this moment. I don't know if you saw the movie Kung Fu Panda. It was always one of my favorite movies. But uh, Master Uwe, in teaching the panda Kung Fu, says this, Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. All we have is the present. And that's why it's a gift. Mindfulness is ultimately the art of living in the now. In this moment, regrets of the past uh, are, are, are remain in the past, and fears of the future remain in the future. In this exact moment, no matter where you are listening to this video, um, we are actually whole and complete. Mindfulness teaches a person to depart uh, to depart from fear from trauma, from impulsivity, from self-defeating thoughts. It's a strategy that teaches people to experience life, thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations really from a new perspective. Sometimes the best way to explain mindfulness is to share with you how I really learned mindfulness myself. Uh, up to this point in my career, I had taught many different clients mindfulness. I had even practiced mindfulness meditation and taught this in therapy. But it was a near tragic day in 2008 that mindfulness really became sort of real for me. I'm not going to recount the whole long story, but I found myself on a charter boat ride. It was a perk for staying as a guest at a resort hotel in rough seas as a typhoon was moving in. The boat was called a banca, a small boat operated by a lifelong fisherman who gave rides to hotel guests in the wind or sail propelled boat. Uh, for extra money to supplement his income. As the seas became rough, it was clear to me that he had lost control of the boat, and as each wave doused us with powerful blasts of water, the rain, it began to hit my face. 
and I started to panic. I knew I was too far out to swim back to land, and the seas were so rough that I surely would have been swallowed up anyway. When I looked at the boat driver, and I saw fear in his eyes, he was a man of the sea, I knew that death was soon imminent. We drifted further from land and his control of the boat became nearly impossible in my panic. I, I was panicked out there on this boat. I felt my body shake. I saw anguished images of my children who would, who would have questioned why I was even out there on this boat ride. I felt sad. I felt fearful. I looked backwards at my life. I looked forward into time. I wondered if I should even jump and I looked into the sky and suddenly when I looked into the sky, Bam, I got hit in the face with a huge raindrop. And it was it was warm. It was more than warm, it was actually hot. The tropical rain that was falling was salty and it was hot. And with the boat moving, it was going pretty quick, each raindrop that splashed on my face actually was full force and it actually really pretty pretty much stung. It was at that moment that I really felt the rain, the heat the force of the rain, it hurt. The sea was white below my seat. The water was splashing underneath me. The wind was powerful. And as I felt those things, I realized I am about to die. And I thought, I don't want to die on this boat. And I'm not ready to die today. And again, anxiety was present. And images of my kids passed through my mind. I could even standing, I could see them standing with frowns and tears in my memorial service. I was suffering on this boat with death probably just a few minutes away, and then, bam, I got hit by another raindrop, hot, salty, and I noticed that raindrop, and I said, that was hot. In noticing it, I recognized that what I had always told my clients was true. This is something I always told them. As long as you're breathing, you're actually okay, no matter what else is going on, because each moment, each breath marks each moment, and the only thing we have is this moment, and so no matter what else is going on, as long as you're breathing, you're actually okay, and so I breathed, and unintentionally, I did what I ask my clients to do in difficult situations, and I took another breath. I didn't try to speed it up or slow it down. I just breathed. And again, I breathed and I paid attention to the wet and salty breath. And I noticed my fear. I even said, there's fear. But I also noticed I was powerless over it. And I just accepted it as fear. And I didn't follow it to more visual images of my kid's funeral. And I took another breath. I breathed in and I breathed out. And although I remained fearful or had fearful thoughts, and rather than following them, I just focused on the breath, breathing each breath in and each breath out. Soon I noticed that the feeling of the waves um, below my feet, uh, or below my seat, and I noticed the wind on my face, and I noticed those rough seas were still rough. I noticed, of course, that they were probably bring impending doom, but I breathed in again. And I noticed that every time I breathed, I stopped following my thoughts of panic and just experienced each breath, each moment. I noticed that my heart rate slowed and my panic became unimportant and I accepted death, not because I wanted to die, by simply noting that that was my thought and an awareness of my mortality. And it's the strangest thing to describe to anybody, but I... I felt human. I felt a part of the sea. And I breathed again. And I understood mindfulness experientially connecting to each moment and just being okay. Now, I have no idea how the boat captain got the boat back under control. But somehow we made it to a small strip of land, a little islandette, and uh, I was safe. <laughs> we got to shore. I got off the boat. I breathed in again. I paid attention to the breath. I didn't even wonder how am I going to get back. And I just paid attention to the breath as I sat there on the shore with the rain coming down. Later that afternoon, when I was able to safely get back to my hotel, I took a camera back to the sea. I recorded it, and I actually posted that as a YouTube video. 
The reason I did this is important. They say, and I don't know who they are, that in our lives when we're old, we're going to look back on our life. And we're going to see the hundred days that defined us, that were most important to us. The key, of course, is to recognize these not in retrospect, but to be able to know when they are as they happen. This day was one of those 100 days. It's the day that I truly experienced mindfulness. I still had my thoughts. I still had my fear. I still had the uncomfortable sensations. I still had awarenesses that were difficult, but rather than following them or becoming enmeshed with them, I simply paid attention to the breath, and in that moment, I was okay. And so that's how I learned or internalized the art of mindfulness. When I work with people to teach them mindfulness, I teach them to do the exact same thing that I do in my self-hypnosis sessions. To sit in a comfortable chair, to create an erect posture that's healthy and supports the intake of air into the deepest part of the lungs. And I ask them to simply pay attention to the breath. We did this a little bit during our induction in part one. In fact, I use mindfulness as a tool in induction with most of my clients in hypnosis, as well as in my own self-hypnosis practice. So go ahead and close your eyes right now and pay attention to the breath. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And one of the things I often hear from people is, I cannot turn off my mind. I cannot stop my thoughts during self-hypnosis. This is the great thing about learning mindfulness. There's no need to turn off our thoughts. In fact, our minds think that's what they do. It would be abnormal for us to turn off our thoughts. Instead, as you sit in this chair, breathing in and breathing out, neither speeding up nor slowing down the breath, but just breathing, you can use this as a focal point, the breath, to bring your attention fully to the sensation of breathing. And so if you have a thought, if you have a feeling, if you have a sensation, you don't have to try to stop it. Instead, just observe it, even label it. That was a thought or a feeling or a sensation. And use that as an indicator that it's time to bring your attention back to the breath and just continue to breathe. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Now go ahead and take in another breath. Let it fill your lungs with oxygen and, and open the eyes. Feeling fantastic from having taken just a moment to practice focusing on the breath. And what mindfulness is, is a strategy or a process of choosing a focal point. In this case, the breath to bring our attention back to whenever we have distressing thoughts or feelings or sensations. It's been a great deal of research into how this simple process that comes about best by practice rather than explanation uh, can be helpful. Mindfulness practice improves the immune uh, system. It alters activation symmetries in the prefrontal cortex, a change previously associated with an increase in positive emotion and faster recovery from negative experiences. A North Carolina University of Chapel study demonstrated a correlation between mindfulness practice in couples and an enhanced relationship. You know, as a marriage and family therapist, this is what I often see. Couples come in and argue about the past or they fear the future. But mindfulness can teach them to be present together, despite what's happened in the past or their fears of the future. Mindfulness-based stress reduction programs uh, have decreased uh, relapse into depressive episodes by over 30%. A great place to look at the efficacy of mindfulness is to go to scholar.google.com and just type in mindfulness. There's a ton of research showing how these simple processes can be really helpful. Mindfulness is a part of self-hypnosis. Michael Yapko in his book, Mindfulness and Hypnosis, highlights the following concepts as they relate to hypnotherapy. Um, the therapeutic value of focus is something that we teach in hypnosis, and it's something that we find true in mindfulness. There's a shared structure and function, which is why I can use mindfulness as induction. And there's value in mindfulness in enhancing suggestion. Because it's a lot easier to change right now than it is to 
do the impossible and change the past or the impossible and change the unknown. The homework assignment that I've provided with this lesson is down below, and there's actually three things. First is a longer, it's an eight-minute MP3 that is a daily practice of mindfulness that explains the goal of mindfulness as we practice it, and it's about eight minutes long. What I'd like you to do with that is your first day or your first two days, I'd like you to actually practice two or three times a day intentionally being mindful using this mp3 because i recognize that the explanation can get redundant after a day or two i've included a bonus mp3 it's a short three minute version um you can email this to your phone for example and, and use this anywhere and it has no explanation of mindfulness it simply guides you through a process of mindfulness so it actually makes the daily practice a little bit shorter. And I've also included a PDF script. The PDF script has a, a basic process for mindfulness you can use with, your, uh, with yourself. Um, you can commit it to memory if you'd like, and you can actually use that as part of your self-hypnosis. And we don't have to focus on the breath. We can really choose to focus on anything. A person can do a walking meditation, for example, using the feet as a focal point to bring their attention back to. I work with a lot of uh, obese clients doing bariatric counseling, and I teach every one of them a raisin meditation to mindfully eat a raisin. It's a great uh, meditation exercise or self-hypnosis session. And, and, and so I've included the script for that because it's something that you might like to practice. It's really pretty cool. These resources can be found right below. And of course, I hope that the practice session that you engage in between now and our next lesson will be helpful to you. Again, if you have any questions, any questions at all, feel free to ask me or those other members of our group at www.icbchgroup.com.